Thank you. Um, welcome to the second day of our course in hypersonic aerodynamics, basic and applied. Um, yesterday you got the basic, today you get the applied. Um, I think those of you who, who sat through ex yesterday's lecture discovered that this course is a little bit um, like taking a, a drink out of a fire hydrant. You're going to get a lot of information. You had a lot of information yesterday, and I think we're going to continue that tradition today. Um, what I hope you will see today, at least this morning, is that many of the concepts we covered in yesterday's portion of the course have direct and important applications in the development of hypersonic aircraft, and specifically the next generation of hypersonic aircraft, which we view as being the obvious next step in the aerospace field. Um, as I mentioned, today is mostly the applied portion, but I think we're going to be taking a somewhat gradual approach, which is this morning I'll be looking at applications of some of the very fundamental concepts that were discussed yesterday. And towards the afternoon we'll be seeing a little bit more design-oriented issues, a little bit more of a design flavor to the course, wrapping us up. Let me start off with a picture which comes to us courtesy of Pratt & Whitney. And that is a picture of the engine system of a proposed hypersonic vehicle. And in fact, this picture is a little bit out of date. This, this vehicle, which you see up here, is an old concept for the National Aerospace Plane. But the point that I want to make with this picture is the following. The engine of a hypersonic en vehicle will undoubtedly be different than any engine which has yet been designed. And the reason is that this engine must be very carefully integrated into the design of the vehicle, more so than any other aircraft that has ever been built or any other spacecraft that has ever been built. Indeed, as we'll see this morning and I think this afternoon, um, much of the rest of the aircraft is performing functions that are associated with the operation of the engine. For instance, uh, the forebody of the vehicle is operating as, as an inlet to the engine. The aft body of the vehicle would be operating as a nozzle. And a good way to think about a hypersonic vehicle of this type, or the sort of vehicle that we talk about for the National Aerospace Plane, is really a single flying propulsion system. Uh, this is especially pleasing to those of us in the propulsion business. And so with that in mind, I want to emphasize that it is very difficult to separate external airframe, external airflow issues from propulsion issues in hypersonics. And it means that problems that we encounter on the forebody of the vehicle are also going to be problems that we encounter inside the engine. Problems we encounter on the aft body of the vehicle are also going to be problems that are a result of what's going on inside the engine. It also means that the performance of the forebody had better be matched to the performance of the engine, or else our vehicle is not going to, going to be working very well. Now, when I talk about vehicles, bear in mind that we, we have yet to build a vehicle of this sort. The National Aerospace Plane has a proposal, is proposing to build an experimental vehicle, the X-30, which would incorporate many of the concepts that we'll be talking about today. But please bear in mind that we're talking about the next generation of vehicles, things that haven't been built. Let me start off with a list of what I think are the key issues. And this is not intended to be an all-inclusive statement of what is involved in hypersonic vehicle design or hypersonic propulsion design, so much as uh, a means of sensitizing you to the various topics that we'll be talking about today. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago in the picture, one of the key issues that we deal with is engine airframe integration. Parts of the airframe, parts of the forebody, aft body of the vehicle, are also operating as parts of the engine. And that's not only a technology nightmare, it's also a management nightmare, because it means that this vehicle must be designed as a completely integrated concept from start to finish. Right. Other issues that we'll be talking about, uh, boundary layers and non-uniformities. Because the forebody of the vehicle is the inlet to the engine, the forebody boundary layer is obviously going to affect the operation of the engine. And dealing with that forebody boundary layer is something that must be considered in the design of the engine. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later. Combustion rates becomes a very, very key issue for hypersonic vehicles. Let me give you an example. Um, at about one atmosphere pressure and about 1,000 degrees, hydrogen burns in about a millisecond in air. And now think about what would be a reasonable size for a hypersonic engine. Let's say we want an engine box which has a length of, I don't know, perhaps three meters, approximately 10 feet. Um, if we're flying a transatmospheric vehicle, let's say we're at about half the speed of the transatmospheric vehicle. Uh, let's say we're traveling at about 10,000 meters per second, which would be about halfway through the, a trajectory up to orbit. Well, that says that our flow is going to be moving through the engine in about a millisecond. So if our combustion takes any longer than a millisecond, we won't get sufficient combustion inside the engine. In other words, we're constantly playing the game of trying to get the fuel to mix and trying to get it to burn. 
fast enough inside that engine before it blows out the back and combusts. Some, the, the goal is to prevent it from combusting somewhere over New York when we're flying over Chicago. And that's, that's a key issue that we'll be dealing with. And also range extension. And that is that we'll see that there are a variety of hypersonic engines which are available to us. Most notice, notably, we'll be talking about the supersonic combustion ramjet, or scramjet. But the scramjet only starts working at about five times the speed of sound. So obviously, you need other propulsion systems that will get you off the ground. And also, if we're flying a hypersonic vehicle to orbit, eventually there's going to come a point where we can no longer breathe air. And that means we've got to switch to some other propulsion system. And incorporating those other propulsion systems, trying to extend the range of our primary propulsion system, is a key issue in, hyperson in the hypersonic propulsion business. Now, I've been talking about engines. And let me just give you a bird's eye view of the propulsion options. And again, this is not intended to be an all-inclusive list, but just a, a smattering of possible engines that could be used to fly us at hypersonic speeds. Um, first, rockets. And of course, that's the approach that was used in the X-15. Um, rockets got the X-15 research vehicle, which we saw a picture of yesterday, up to about six and a half times the speed of sound. Um, we talked about the space shuttle being a hypersonic vehicle. It flies at Mach 25 when it re-enters. Of course, when it's re-entering, it's coming in as an unpowered glider. But it was originally boosted to those speeds with rocket power. Ramjets. Uh, ramjets are engines that we know how to build. We fly them today. Um, ramjets, as we'll see, work up to about Mach 5, Mach 6. So that's an engine which we can use to begin to touch the hypersonic regime. But it won't get us very far into the hypersonic regime. Ramjets also have a problem that they don't work very, very well at low speed. And we'll see that in a moment. So ramjets cannot be used as a single propulsion option. Some, some solutions to that. One is the air turbo ramjet, which we won't be getting into extensive details of today. But uh, suffice to say, it's a concept which incorporates both a ramjet and a traditional compressor turbine system. Uh, the only difference in the air turbo ramjet is that the turbine of this particular engine is powered off a separate gas generator that isolates the turbine from the airflow. So we don't have the usual temperature limits that we encounter when we try to fly a gas turbine engine at high speeds. Hybrid cycle engines. Those are uh, combinations of cycles which get us from ground Mach number zero into the hypersonic regime. Um, we actually have experience building hybr uh, hybrid cycle engines. The SR-71 spy plane, a uh, reconnaissance vehicle, flies or flew until recently with a hybrid cycle engine. It's an engine which was an afterburning turbojet and at high speed ducted doors closed off the uh, compressor turbine assembly, ducted the air around into the afterburner, and then the afterburner effectively worked like a ramjet. So that was a hybrid engine. Now, in the realm of hypersonic propulsion that we're dealing with today, in association with vehicles like the NASA vehicle, several engines have been mentioned. One is a liquid air cycle engine. Now, liquid air cycle engine is really a very clever concept. The idea is as follows. Hypersonic vehicle will, will undoubtedly be powered by cryogenic fuels, especially at the high speed range. For instance, liquid hydrogen. And you know, liquid hydrogen is very cold. Well, one solution to the propulsion problem is as follows. Build a condenser. Build it into your inlet. And run that condenser with your cryogenic fuel. So in other words, you're circulating cryogenic fuel through condenser elements in the inlet. Air comes into the inlet, hits this condenser, and liquefies. You collect the liquid oxygen from the liquid air. And then you burn the liquid oxygen with, with liquid hydrogen in a propulsion system in a conventional rocket engine. The advantage of this is we know how to build rocket engines that burn liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. So developing the propulsion system is not very difficult. The disadvantage is that we have to develop an inlet with this condenser system, which, has, which is sufficiently uh, uh, efficient to condense enough oxygen, but yet which doesn't have enough drag and doesn't burden the vehicle with, enough, with too much weight. Um, this last technology issue has been one of the reasons that it has not been focused on in this country. Um, not all that much work has gone on liquid air cycle engines in this country. But the British have looked at it extensively. And the Japanese are also looking at the liquid air cycle engine. They've built some test engines, which seem to work relatively well. Um, one warning about the liquid air cycle engine, and that is that for those of you who, who are familiar with basic propulsion concepts, a fundamental tenet of air breathing propulsion is that the exhaust velocity of your propulsion system had better be greater than the inlet velocity of your propulsion system, or else you're not producing positive thrust. Well, the maximum exhaust velocity of a liquid air cycle engine is the maximum exhaust velocity of the rocket engine that we're incorporating into the system. Rocket engines are limited to about 4,500 4, uh, meters per second. Well, that's about half orbital speed. So liquid air cycle engines on their own are probably not sufficient to get you up to orbital speed unless you play some additional games. For instance, store some mass on the way up to orbit 
and then later on in the flight, use that mass to, in, to, uh, to increase your thrust. Okay, supersonic combustion engines. Um, this is the engine we'll be focusing on today, and it's the engine that is seen as the key engine to America's hypersonic entry, um, the X-30. And in many ways, I make the point that the supersonic combustion engine is really the very simplest engine you could possibly conceive of in principle. It's basically just an engine box, a combustor in, with an inlet, a supersonic inlet, air flows. It's not even decelerated. Fuel is dumped in. It mixes. It burns. The exhaust goes out the back of the system. No moving parts, no spinning parts intrinsically. Of course, it sounds great in theory. In practice, there are some very, very difficult technology issues associated with getting a combustion system, building a combustion system that works at supersonic speeds. That nation wave engines um, are engines we won't be talking about very much. It's a relatively new concept and one that has not received very much attention. Essentially, in a detonation wave engine, we use a shock wave to induce combustion um, as opposed to the traditional uh, uh, flame propagation concepts that will be used in the scramjet engine. One of the difficulties with detonation wave engines is you have to get very uniform mixing before the shock wave can induce the combustion. Um, and so it's not clear how we could incorporate those in current concepts for hypersonic vehicles. And finally, external burning. Uh, the idea of doing away with the engine altogether, just dumping fuel and burning it outside the vehicle. Uh, that's a concept that's been looked at and is still being looked at in application to transatmospheric vehicles. Again, it's not something we'll be talking about. External burning tends to be very inefficient because it's hard to maintain the pressure during the combustion process. But it has been suggested to augment hypersonic vehicles through some of the more difficult portions of their flight. Specifically, you might consider a, a hypersonic vehicle which is having trouble punching through the transonic region using some external burning at its nozzle just to increase some, the thrust for small portions of its flight. Okay, having set the stage, let's look at the range of options and see where they fit. Um, one of the uh, key reasons that we're interested in hypersonic propulsion is that the effect of specific impulse of a hypersonic propulsion system should be much larger than conventional rocket engines. And what do we mean by specific impulse? Well, specific impulse is defined as the thrust per unit weight flow of fuel that is used to produce that thrust. Now, when we say that a hypersonic engine has much higher specific impulse than a rocket engine, what we're really saying is that a hypersonic vehicle is able to swallow air, which, it, which contains the oxidizer. And so it's carrying less, a smaller portion of its fuel on board the vehicle. So when we do the accounting, when we compare the thrust, the, the fuel that we carried on board the vehicle, we find that we're carrying less fuel because we're not carrying all that oxidizer. Now, as a typical number, the space shuttle uh, at takeoff um, is uh, 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 approximately 75 to 80 percent of its takeoff weight is composed of oxidizer in the external tank and in the solid rocket boosters. So if you can get rid of all that oxidizer, if you can breathe air and use an air breathing engine, then obviously you, you should be able to realize an enormous weight savings. And that's indicated by the high specific impulse. Um, as we talked about, ramjets are the, are the only real accelerating hypersonic engines that we've built to date. Ramjets will start kicking in at about Mach 1, although they don't really work very well until you get somewhat above that. And ramjets will run to about Mach 6, and we'll talk about what limits that. Um, the supersonic combustion ramjet starts working down around Mach 5, and in theory, it should be able to work all the way up to orbital speeds, in theory. Um, there's some question about that. But certainly, scramjets should be able to work in the Mach 6 to Mach 12 range, and probably a little bit beyond. Fuel sources, um, you notice that there are two fuels listed here. One is hydrogen, one is hydrocarbon. Um, as I mentioned, one of the key issues is the combustion rate inside the engine. And realistically, the only fuel that gives us enough, a fast enough combustion rate is hydrogen. So if we talk about the high Mach number range, orbital speeds in hypersonic vehicles, we're really talking about hydrogen fuel. If we're satisfied with the lower range of hypersonic flight, uh, the Mach 6, Mach 7, even Mach 8 range, then perhaps hydrocarbon fuels would be viable. And indeed, there's a great deal of work going on now in development of, of hydrocarbon fuels. Let me just uh, mention one type of fuel called an endothermic fuel, um, which seems to have nice properties because it can soak in a lot of heat from the vehicle and then release that heat inside the engine. And by the way, let me, let, me, uh, let me step back and say that if anyone has any questions, please feel free to interrupt at any point. OK. Um, just to set the stage, again, technology spin-offs. Uh, what technologies do we think we'll realize from the development of hypersonic technology? hypersonic propulsion. And I think also, what technologies do we have to advance before we can realistically build hypersonic vehicles? Um, first one is computers. Uh, we are seeing an explosion in CFD related not only to hypersonic propulsion, but hypersonic vehicle design. 
Um, hypersonics is driving computer code development, and I think it's driving our requirements on the computers that are being used for code development. Right now, numbers usually bandied about that approximately 70% of the supercomputer time being used in the country right now is being devoted to hypersonics. Um, and that, that should impress you. <laughs> um, materials, obviously that's an important issue not only for the engine but for the rest of the airframe. And I think one of the successes we've seen in recent years in the NAS program has been the development of new high strength materials. If there's one area which we've seen tangible results, it's this area. Uh, fuels, as I said, um, this ve these vehicles will almost certainly have to operate with advanced fuels, probably hydrogen. That means we have to become very good at handling those fuels and stirring those fuels. And consider the nightmare of flying a hypersonic vehicle up to orbit with a cryogenic fuel tank, and that cryogenic fuel tank will probably be, be in contact with a skin that could be up to several thousand degrees because of frictional effects due to the hypersonic, hypersonic heating. Um, facilities, not only computer facilities, testing facilities, handling facilities are also things that we're seeing th that are coming out of our, our advances in hypersonic, hypersonics, not only for the airframe, but, but for the propulsion system as well. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, not only extension of the envelope, but management. Uh, the fact that we're talking about total vehicle integration, engine airframe integration on a scale that has never been dealt with before, um, is not only a technology issue, but I think it's a, key, a management issue. Okay, what are the applications? Why are we interested in this? And specifically, what, what sort of engine applications we'll be looking at? Um, to date, our experience in high-speed flight, operational high-speed flight, is really only one vehicle. That is the SR-71. You may know that in the mid-60s, the Air Force built a vehicle called the XB-70, which was a hypersonic bomber. That, f well, uh, 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 it was a high Mach number bomber, Mach 3.5, which is technically below what we would consider to be hypersonic. But yet it started to point in the direction of hypersonics. And the SR-71 is also a vehicle that flew at about 3.5 times the speed of sound. You know, it was recently decommissioned. Again, that's not quite hypersonic, but it's close. It's pointing us in that direction. An obvious spin-off from the SR-71 would be something that can fly faster, maybe a Mach 6 or a faster reconnaissance vehicle. And indeed, there are even rumors and periodic photographs that appear in Aviation Week, which suggest that a vehicle of this sort is even flying today. Um, High-speed business market is a question market he mark here. Uh, there have been some nice studies done at Ohio State University into this, and their conclusion is, yes, you could build a high-speed business aircraft, but it would probably cost about $30,000 per ticket. Um, <laughs> We won't be arguing economics in this short course, so I'll skip over that very quickly. <laughs> um, high-speed fighters also a question mark. I think whenever we talk about uh, high-speed reconnaissance, the question comes up, can you build a high-speed fighter? I think it's a questionable one because our experience has been that speed uh, only gets you so far in a fighter. And in fact, the, the trend today has been to roll back the top speed of our fighter aircraft. Uh, maneuverability seems to be much more of an important issue. But certainly, hypersonic bombers uh, have a, a, a great deal of attraction. I mean, intrinsically, you could think of a vehicle which has the operational capabilities of both an ICBM. In other words, it can fly as, 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 as it can be as, as, um, as uninterceptable as an ICBM, and yet it have the recallability and controllability of a bomber aircraft. The Orient Express is the vehicle that Ronald Reagan first alluded to when he announced the National Aerospace Plane Program. In some ways, that has been the curse that has stuck with the National Aerospace Plane Program. Um, and the Orient Express is the name given to a vehicle that could fly from New York to Tokyo in about two hours. And the reason I say that's been the curse is that the minute you mention that to people, they usually say, well, why w would you want to fly from New York to Tokyo in two hours? And again, we won't be arguing that in this class. Just keep that in mind as an impossible application. Um, I think the most attractive ideas are, are orbit on demand, single stage to orbit, and suborbital sorties. A hypersonic vehicle would basically give you the capabilities of something like a space shuttle, but with the operational requirements of an airplane or perhaps, perhaps a sophisticated airplane, something like an SR-71, but it would still give you the capability of keeping a vehicle on the runway, say a Dulles or a National Airport, keeping a pilot in a ready room, and when you want to fly someone up to orbit, you tell them run out to the runway, hop in the cockpit, hit the start button, and get them up there. Um, that's a very attractive option, and I think that that's going to be the key to driving hypersonic technology. Now, to be honest, there are a lot of things, we have a lot of stumbling blocks in the hypersonic field. One is the limitations of test facilities, available test facilities. And you probably wouldn't be surprised to know that we're in a much worse situation today than we were 25 years ago. Um, you know, hypersonics has gone through some cycles, and in, at least in the last downtrend, uh, several hypersonic facilities were dismantled. The key that I want to bring out in this, in this plot is that the real flight test regime goes beyond our current 
testing capabilities. Now, indeed, there are some suggestions that we can do transient facilities, shock tunnels that give us uh, um, some ta data which can be applied to flight. But the reality is that before we have confidence in flying a hypersonic vehicle, we have to have two things. One, computer codes that we believe in and computer codes that we validate. And two, we really have to fly. If you don't fly, you'll never know if the vehicle will work. And that means that everything we say in, in, in the, context, uh, the context of everything I'm talking about really rests on building it and demonstrating it. And I think that's going to be one of the key goals of the NAS program and our future work in hypersonics. OK, to start off talking about specific propulsion systems, let's talk about the basic ramjet. We'll analyze the basic ramjet. I won't derive the equations, but I'll explain the performance of the ramjet. And we'll see what the limitations of the ramjet are. And that will point us in the direction of higher speed applications, specifically the supersonic combustion ramjet. Um, as many of you may know, the ramjet is a Brayton cycle engine. That's a specific thermodynamic cycle, um, which I will be talking about in a moment. Um, the thrust of the ramjet is described by the thrust equation for an air-breathing engine. There are basically two components of the thrust equation. One is the momentum flux, and the other is the pressure difference across the exit plane. M dot is the mass flow through the, f through the engine. UE is the exhaust velocity. U naught is the flight velocity. Um, PE is the pressure in the exit plane of the engine. PA is the ambient pressure. And AE is the exit area. Now, it can be shown through various proofs that the ideal design, the maximum thrust, occurs when you match the exit pressure to the ambient pressure. And when people look at this equation, they usually question that. Say, they say, hey, it looks like if I step up the exit pressure, then I can get positive, a positive thrust term out of here. Let me point out that increasing the exit pressure means that you haven't expanded the flow very much, as much. That means that the exhaust velocity is generally lower. So there is a trade-off between these two terms. And the optimum is usually found when this term is designed to be approximately zero. So by design, we can usually neglect that term. And if that term is large, that means we've done a bad design. Um, specific impulse, as I mentioned before, is the, defined as the thrust per unit weight flow of fuel. And it's a convenient way to describe the performance of a propulsion system. In the air breathing business, it's conventional to talk about uh, specific fuel consumption. Um, that's just the inverse of specific impulse. And I think the trend is more and more in the air breathing community to use specific impulse because it's the term in use in the rocket propulsion business. And one of the things we'll see is that hypersonics really blends the two. So. Um, to talk about an idealized ramjet, we can make the following assumptions. One, let's assume that there's no total pressure loss in the engine. That's a bad assumption. You know that if there's a shock at the inlet, there'll be total pressure loss. Uh, the heat addition process in the engine will induce total pressure losses. But in general, those will be relatively small. And an exercise that we put our undergraduates through and we teach them propulsion is to analyze an ideal ramjet, then put in all the total pressure losses. And they find that when all is said and done, the idealized model gives you a pretty good estimate of how the ramjet's going to operate. We'll assume the nozzle is ideally expanded. And we'll assume the energy is added only in the combustor. In other words, all the combustion occurs inside the combustor. No combustion proceeds in the nozzle. We do that if we assume the total pressure loss is zero. And if we assume that the exit pressure of the nozzle is designed to be equal to the ambient pressure. And if we assume that gamma is constant through the engine. Again, that's not a particularly good assumption. But if we make that assumption, we come to the result that the exit Mach number of that engine should be equal to the flight Mach number. That's a very interesting result because it simplifies the rest of the analysis of the engine. Uh, how does this result change if we introduce those not those those if we introduce introduce losses? Um, losses will mean that the exit Mach number has to be larger than the flight Mach number. So that's a that's a lower limit. Okay, um, the total temperature at exit through that engine is really the total temperature of the incoming flow. That's the static temperature of the ambient gas times 1 plus gamma minus 1 over 2 times the square of the flight Mach number times the total temperature ratio across the burner. So in other words, T total V in this expression is the total temperature coming out the back of the burner, at the back of the combustor. And T total 0 is the incoming total temperature off the inlet. Introducing those, we can show that the thrust of the ramjet has the following behavior. It scales with the square root of the ratio of the burner total temperature limit and the incoming total temperature ratio, incoming total temperature times the Mach number. And notice here that I'm referencing the thrust to the mass flow through the engine and the ambient speed of sound. 
But the mass flow through the engine really determines the size of the engine. So what we've done is normalize this to the size of the engine. And the ambient speed of sound is really just a function of your altitude. So this portion of the thrust expression, the uh, total temperature and Mach number portion, really tells you how that ramjet is performing for any given altitude and any given engine size. And then just dividing through to get specific impulse, we divide thrust by the unit weight flow of fuel, and we get the following expression. And we can isolate these constants. H is the heat value of the fuel. It's the energy per unit mass of the fuel. A naught is the ambient speed of sound. G is uh, the gravitational constant at Earth. And that comes in because specific impulse is just defined per weight flow of fuel instead of per mass of fuel. So that's a unit's conversion. Cp, I'm sorry, that should be a C sub p, is the heat capacity. And T naught is the ambient static temperature. OK, what does that look like? Well, we get the following thrust behavior. At Mach number 0, the ramjet doesn't work very well. As you increase the Mach number, we approach some peak, usually in the neighborhood of Mach 2.5, Mach 3. Depends on the specifics of the engine. As we continue to increase the Mach number, we see the thrust starts to roll off again until we get to about Mach 6, Mach 6.5, and we, we're down to zero thrust. Okay. Why is it? Why do we get these two limits? And what do they say about what we need to do if we want to fly at higher Mach numbers? Well, in order to see that, let me just present a plot which isn't in your notes, of the basic Brayton engine cycle. This is the engine cycle we use to describe most air breathing propulsion systems and also the, the, the ramjet cycle. Brayton engine cycle has the following steps. One, um, the inlet gives us an effectively constant entropy compression process. The combustor, we assume, is a constant pressure combustor. Turns out that's a good design. If we have a constant pressure combustor, that means the flow is generally well behaved inside the engine. Uh, expand out through the nozzle, and then we mix in the atmosphere, and that's at a constant pressure condition. Well, think about what's going to happen first at the low Mach number range. At low Mach numbers, Mach number zero, there's no compression. Remember, the, the ramjet works only off of ram compression into the front of the engine. There are no moving parts. There are no fans blowing air through the engine. So at low Mach numbers, there's no compression. That means that this leg of the cycle is effectively has zero height. Well, that means that the cycle can do no work. Our cycle collapses into itself, and there's no effective work in the cycle. Now think about what's happening at the high Mach number range. Okay. The temperature inside the engine is limited ultimately by two things. Materials limits inside that engine, but we can even get around that. We can get around materials. We can cool the walls of the engine. But ultimately, we're going to run against a temperature limit imposed by the chemistry, imposed by the fuel combustion. At some point, we're going, to get the f we're, we're going to be getting the air so hot that we don't get any more combustion inside the engine. In fact, if we dump fuel into that hot air, the fuel will dissociate and we'll lose en energy. That's an ultimate upper limit on the temperature in that engine. Well, now think about what's going on at the inlet. As we up the Mach number, the inlet temperature is rising because the inlet is decelerating the air, so we're decelerating effectively to the total temperature. And the total temperature squ scales with the square root of the Mach number. So as Mach number increases, the effective total temperature increases, and that means that the inlet temperature to the combustor is increasing. Well, eventually, we're going to hit a point where the inlet temperature to the combustor is equal to the ultimate temperature that the combustor can get to due to fuel considerations. When that happens, you can't add any energy inside the combustor, so the ramjet stops working. And that occurs at about Mach 6.5. OK. Well, let's go back to that plot and say, how do we get around this? Um, at the low Mach numbers, the answer is pretty much you need a different engine. You need something that, will get, that can pump air through the system and add additional compression. And indeed, that's why modern aircraft fly with compressors and turbines. It pumps the air through at low speeds. What do we do with the high speed range? Well, the high speed range, I'm always reminded of the joke about the guy who goes to the doctor and says, doctor, it hurts whenever I do this. And the doctor says, well, simple solution, don't do this. Well, what's hurting us in the ramjet design? The thing that's hurting us is that we're decelerating the air and the static temperature is coming up to the total temperature. And that's too hot for the combustion system. So the answer is, if it's the temperature rise in the engine that's hurting you, don't, don't let the temperature rise. How do you do that? Simple answer. Don't decelerate the flow. Keep the flow moving at a high speed through it, the, the engine. And if you do that, the static temperature doesn't approach the total temperature. It remains closer to the ambient temperature. And so you still have a margin in which you can add fuel, increase the t heat, and get some effective work out of the cycle. So the key to high speed flight, the key to our lofty plans for getting above this Mach 6.5 limit of the ramjet, 
is the supersonic combustion ramjet, an engine in which the flow continues through the engine at high speed. It is never decelerated, never slowed up to the point where its temperature becomes so high that combustion becomes impossible. Now let me make one aside here, and that is you will often hear the statement that scramjets are being pursued because of pressure recovery considerations in the inlet. And that's really very, very secondary. The only reason you do the scramjet is because of the temperature limitations. And as we'll see a little bit later on, pressure recovery is really a secondary issue. Okay, as I said, scramjet is really the simplest type of engine. It consists of the following three parts. A supersonic inlet in which the goal is to keep the shocks on those inlets as weak as possible. A supersonic combustion channel in which fuel is mixed and burns in some means. And by the way, that's a really tricky thing to do. And finally, a supersonic nozzle. And again, hammering home a point, the inlet is probably mostly the forebody of the vehicle, and the nozzle is mostly the aft portion of the vehicle. Okay. Advantages of the scramjet, as I said, solves that temperature problem, and there are no major moving parts. The disadvantages are, as near as we can tell, no one's ever flown one. We don't even know if it'll work. But it's looking very promising. In fact, there are rumors now that there are indeed fly operating flying scramjets. And perhaps individuals who are, who are keyed into the classified literature, maybe sitting in this room or in the short course, know of flying scramjets and are, and, and are, are smiling smugly. And I, I, and I hope you're right. Um, I mentioned that the scramjet is not being used because of pressure recovery. Indeed, that's because we run into a very interesting trade-off in scramjet design. The scramjet inlet is going to be more efficient than a ramjet inlet because we don't have strong shocks. The shocks are weak because we're keeping the flow at supersonic speeds. In a ramjet, we want to decelerate the flow all the way down to a subsonic speed. And that means we have to have strong shocks, and strong shocks have lots of losses. But there's another penalty we pay with the scramjet. And that is that we're adding the heat at relatively high Mach numbers. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the classic solution of one-dimensional flow with heat addition, you know that when you add heat at high Mach number, you take a high loss in total pressure. That's a fundamental result. There's no way around that. If you add heat at high Mach number, you're going to lose total pressure. If you add, add heat at low Mach number, you see almost no total pressure losses. So in fact, the scramjet becomes a game between trading off heat addition losses, total pressure losses in the combustor, and losing those total pressure losses off the inlet. One of the things that that says to us is the inlet has to be absolutely as efficient as possible, because you're already taking a pretty big hit inside the combustor. You don't want to take any more hits on the inlet, and also off the nozzle. So you want a pretty good inlet design. And these are just some numbers I've, I've plotted out. Uh, this is flight Mach number. This is the total pressure ratio across uh, a shock a normal shock, and this is the total pressure ratio associated with heat addition in a constant area channel. Scramjet probably wouldn't be a constant area channel, but it gives you at least some indication of how the total pressure will scale. And you see that at high Mach numbers, the total pressure loss across a normal shock becomes quite substantial. But you also see that at high Mach numbers, the total pressure loss associated with heat addition can become substantial as well. And that's why we generally say that scramjets don't work very well below about Mach 5, because below about Mach 5, uh, the trade-off is such that the engine just doesn't work very well. All right, some other considerations for scramjets. Um, I mentioned that the primary reason for going with the scramjet and going with air-breathing propulsion in general, the primary justification for this, is we can realize effectively very high specific impulses. Um, on the order of about 300 seconds. Now, in comparison, uh, rocket engines, best we do now, space shuttle main engines, give us about 455 seconds. The most advanced rocket engines we're talking about today, nuclear engines, maybe can give us about 1,000 seconds. So hypersonics is very promising from that standpoint. Of course, there are going to be some drawbacks. In general, air-breathing engines weigh much more than their rocket power counterparts. Right? For example, um, rocket engines, a good example of a rocket engine, uh, the rocket engines that power the Atlas booster, have a thrust to weight ratio, and here I'm just including the weight of the engine itself, not the entire vehicle, of about 120. Compare that to a conventional ramjet. Ramjets scale thrust to weight ratios of about seven. But where's all the extra weight coming from? Well, there's a lot of ducting. The inlets, the nozzles tend to be larger, a lot of duct work associated with that. That adds a lot of weight. What that's really telling you is that we're very good at building rocket engines. We can build a very efficient, we can build very efficient rocket engines. 
We're not so good at building air-breathing engines. So immediately, you begin to question this trade-off. All right, you've gotten better specific impulse, but has it been at the expense of the weight of the engine? The answer is probably yes. So one of the keys that you have to do is minimize the weight of the engine system. Um, other considerations. Um, a hypersonic vehicle, especially one that's going to fly faster than Mach 15 or so, probably needs an active cooling system. That's a difficult thing to build. Not only is it difficult, but we can look at some bit raw numbers and say, how do we cool the vehicle? Well, chances are you'll use the fuel on board the vehicle to cool the, to cool the skin and cool the engine. Um, if you look at a fuel like hydrogen, you very quickly come to the conclusion that hydrogen has about one quarter of the heat capacity required to cool the vehicle all the way up to orbit if you use only a stoichiometric mixture of hydrogen inside the engine. In other words, if you size the vehicle so you have just enough hydrogen to burn with the oxygen that you'll be intaking through the engine, you find that that hydrogen is not sufficient to cool the vehicle. What that means is you probably have to fly with a little bit more hydrogen than the engine actually needs. Um, and again, that's going to bite into the weight savings and the fuel savings that you realize in the hypersonic engine. So there's, there are trade-offs here, and there are technology issues that have to be pushed. Um, whenever you go to any seminar, any talk on hypersonic, hypersonics, you always see the generic hypersonic vehicle. And it starts to get funny after a while because you'll notice that everyone has their own generic hypersonic vehicle picture, but they all look pretty much the same. And in retrospect, it's not very surprising that they all look very much the same because there are certain key features of a hypersonic vehicle that we all know must be incorporated no matter what the picture ultimately looks like. And those key features are as follows. Um, as you heard yesterday, in hypersonic flight, shock waves are pressed very close to the surface. That means that these vehicles have to be very long and very slender. Um, in order to have good aerodynamic performance at high speeds, we want relatively sharp leading edges. Now, also, as you heard yesterday, that means you're going to have heating problems. And so part of hypersonic vehicle design is a trade-off between aerodynamic performance and heating and heating considerations. And it's never really clear where that trade-off, how that trade-off works out. Um, as I mentioned, we've got a blended airframe. Uh, the forebody works as the engine inlet. The aft body works as the nozzle. And what we call the engine is really just the combustion box. Um, one other feature that I want to point out, which will be pertinent for our discussion today, um, the shock wave, which is pressed very close to the body, probably will want to be close to the lip of the engine inlet. If it's far away from the lip in either direction, if it's either far, far below the lip or swallowed inside the engine, that engine is probably not working very well. So one of the design criteria is to locate that shock somewhere near that lip. Now, of course, the question is how close does it have to be? And that's a very good question, because if it's exactly on the lip, we may experience deleterious heating effects. Um, if it gets swallowed into, into the engine, we could have some very bad things happening, shocks reflecting down the engine, possibly burn-throughs at the engine wall, um, things we obviously don't want to have happen. Okay. Um, as I said, the inlet for that vehicle is the forebody. That means we have to worry about what the flow in the forebody is doing. We have to worry about the boundary layer in that forebody because it get, may get swallowed into the engine. That, not only do we worry about the boundary layer, we ask the most basic questions about the boundary layer. Is it, tr is it transitional flow? Is it a laminar boundary layer or a turbulent boundary layer? And one of the things that I think you'll be surprised at is it's one of the big unknowns that we have in hypersonics. We don't know if the boundary layer going into a NASA-like vehicle will be, will be laminar or turbulent today. We have some pretty good ideas, but this is a wide open field. Um, shock interactions, if the shocks interact with the boundary layer, or if the shocks in the inlet interact with the, the lip of the engine, what will that do to the vehicle? Uniformity considerations, we've got a boundary layer coming, if we had to swallow it, that means that the flow coming into the engine will be highly non-uniform. Also, it would be desirable to make the, the flow across the vehicle as uniform as possible. Because one of the schemes for hypersonic vehicle design would be to incorporate different engine modules spanning across the vehicle. Um, that means we'd like the flow on the inlet to be moving as straight back as possible. And that may not be easy. And finally, combustion requirements. The, the flow that comes in off the inlet had better be sufficient to allow for adequate combustion in the engine. What does that mean? Well, it means that the flow that's delivered to the combustor had better be at the right temperature and the right pressure, or the combustion system just won't work. And the key technology issues associated with combustion, getting the fuel to mix inside the engine, turns out to be a very, very difficult problem. When fuel is injected into a supersonic stream, it tends to remain in a nice uniform stream. Now, there are things you can do to try to get the fuel to mix, but those usually involve introducing losses to the engine. I mean, for instance, you could inject the fuel and have a blunt body and have the fuel hit that blunt body, but that's also going to generate a strong shock, and that's going to induce losses. 
Um, a variety of mixing schemes are being looked at, and usually they come down to a trade-off between loss mechanisms and adequate mixing. Combustion, as I said, we're, we're playing a game here with combustion. We're trying to get the fuel to burn before it blows out the back of the engine. And it turns out that even with the best fuel hydrogen, we usually come pretty close to that margin. And that's something that we have to worry about. And finally, a nozzle length trade-off. Um, since the aft portion of the vehicle is the nozzle, we have to start worrying about the, the size of the nozzle versus the engine performance. Right? Let's say, for instance, we don't get complete combustion inside the engine. We would like to think that we can realize at most of the rest of the combustion energy off the nozzle. In other words, as the flow is moving in the nozzle, it's still combusting, still reacting, still giving us a little bit thru of thrust. Um, that generally means we need a long path length for that nozzle, which means a large nozzle. Remember, that nozzle is the whole aft body of the vehicle. So what we're really saying is, in order for combustion to continue on the nozzle, we need a long aft body, which is a long vehicle, which is a heavy vehicle. And so there's always a fight between the airframe people and the combustion people on that issue. How do we evaluate performance of inlet inlets? Um, in subsonic speeds, there are some very well-known means of evaluating inlet performance. Uh, most notably, we use total pressure recovery. Total pressure, uh, station four is usually is generically used to indicate the station coming in after the compression system. And station zero is generically used to indicate the station in, at ambient flow conditions, so ahead of the engine. Um, usually, we evaluate a, an inlet based on the ratio of total pressure coming out of the inlet versus total pressure going into the inlet. Um, the problem is that once we get about above Mach 15, we, run pr into, we, we don't quite know what the state relations are for the gas. And we, we talked yesterday about some of the things that happen to a gas at high Mach numbers. Um, and so it's no longer easy to define the total pressure, especially coming out the back of the inlet. So it becomes more and more difficult to work with the total pressure recovery. And as a result, in the hypersonic business, we tend to adopt other means of evaluating inlet efficiency. The most common one you'll see is the kinetic energy efficiency. That's the available kinetic energy after an isentropic expansion coming out of the inlet divided by the initial available kinetic energy. In other words, you look at the flow coming at the back of the inlet, put it through an isentropic, uh, imagine that it goes through an isentropic expansion, ask yourself how much kinetic energy is available there, then compare it to the kin kinetic energy that came into the inlet in the first place. And that's an indication of your efficiency. Um, it sounds like a nice idea because you, you get away from having to know anything about the state of the gas. The problem with kinetic energy efficiency is it turns out to be very sensitive. For most hypersonic engines, we wind up defining kinetic energy efficiencies uh, that must be evaluated to three decimal places. Right? The difference between a good, de good inlet and a bad inlet may rest on a third decimal place, 97.3% uh, as opposed to 97.2%. And so that makes you a little bit uncomfortable about using this as a good indication of, in of inlet performance. Um, other things that are used, isentropic efficiency, uh, static pressure recovery, entropy rise, um, and process efficiency. And let me just uh, point to process efficiency. That's basically uh, a situation where you take the difference in enthalpy, the, the enthalpy coming at the back of the inlet, minus the enthalpy if you went through an isentropic expansion, divided by the enthalpy coming at the back of the inlet, minus the initial enthalpy of the flow. Now, indeed, you can transfer, you can, you can convert between the various efficiencies. Let me show you one such process. Um, in this case, I'm converting between the kinetic energy efficiency and the total pressure efficiency, the total pressure recovery efficiency. Um, and this is assuming that kinetic energy efficiency is equal to 0.97, which turns out to be a pretty good number for most hypersonic applications. Um, notice we can, we can, we can very simply uh, incorporate the equations for kinetic energy efficiency uh, into the total pressure ratio. You see it appears in this equation. I won't go through the derivation of these, but it's relatively straightforward. Um, and you see that as we increase the Mach number for a fixed kinetic energy efficiency, we're taking a, a big penalty in total pressure ratio. And that's one of the, one of the nice things. It turns out that, t that the kinetic energy efficiency is a relatively constant value across a wide range of Mach numbers, whereas the total pressure ratio efficiency changes dramatically across many Mach numbers. That's another reason that we tend to go with the kinetic energy efficiency. And by the way, as a baseline, I've shown you the total pressure ratio across the normal shock, and you see that that's even worse. Um, what this effectively is, is telling us is that at the higher Mach numbers, in order to keep a constant kinetic energy efficiency, our shocks are relatively weak oblique shocks, not the strong normal shocks. Uh, and that makes sense because we're trying to keep the flow at supersonic speeds, at high speeds. Okay. Um, let me give you one very, very personal warning. 
and that is that I think far too much attention is paid in the hypersonic engine business to the issue of inlet efficiency. And the reason is that these vehicles will be highly, highly integrated vehicles. It really isn't meaningful to talk about an inlet efficiency without talking about how that inlet will couple to the rest of the engine. Right? I could give you the world's greatest inlet, but if it doesn't supply the flow that I need in the engine, it'll be completely useless. And there are many papers that have been written arguing over which is the best efficiency. Should we use kinetic energy efficiency or total pressure recovery? And I think these people are really arguing in a vacuum. And again, that's, 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 that's a very personal perspective. Uh, but I think you really have to evaluate the whole engine system in order to understand if the inlet is any good. OK. Um, inlet types. How do we design the inlet? Uh, basically, there are three, three fundamental geometries that are available to us. First is a flat surface. Now remember, one of our goals that we mentioned is to provide flow which is as uniform as possible. And so your first thought might be, well, hey, a flat surface is probably a very good way to go. A flat, nice flat surface, nice uniform flow. Um, and indeed, let me go back to the, one of the, the picture that I showed at the beginning. Right here. You see that in this particular artist's rendering, the region right in front of the inlet is really quite flat. You notice that inlet is a square inlet. And one of the goals there is to provide uniform flow. Um, another aspect of having a flat inlet, by the way, is that they're easy to analyze, which is, believe me, has many advantages. OK, other options, concave inlet, um, an inlet which, which curves inward. And let me just indicate a pen. What we mean by that, basically, if we're looking at the front of the hypersonic vehicle, then a concave inlet would be an inlet which is shaped as follows. The top of the vehicle would be as follows. We have some control. And the engines would be arranged inside the concavity. Um, there have been a variety of schemes proposed for concave inlets. And they have some very ma many attractive features. Indeed, one way, I like to think of the concave inlet as a rocket nozzle turned backwards. So in other words, if you look at a side view of the vehicle, it looks as follows. It's basically an inlet which is cut in half which, and which is flying forward. Um, one of the major advantages of this sort of inlet is that the leading edge of the vehicle is right here. It's this line here. And that's going to be the, hard hard, the hot portion of the vehicle. Um, so you minimize the size of the leading edge. Um, also, concave inlets, the suggestion is made that if you look at the geometry of the concave inlet, you can actually build a vehicle with better volume efficiency than if you have a flat surface or even a con convex surface. Um, I won't go into that. It's beyond the scope of what we want to talk about today. But bear in mind that there are people who are favoring these, although they tend to be in the minority. Right? Convex inlet is just an inlet which runs in the other direction. And I'll be showing you some examples of convex inlets. Um, basically, it's an inlet which is shaped as follows, and the engines are located along the convex surface. Um, one of the reasons that I personally tend to favor convex inlets is I think that if you design it correctly, you're more likely to get uniform flow than even for a flat surface. And that has to do with uh, uh, pressure containment underneath that vehicle. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, in the axial direction of an inlet, we can have several different designs. Simplest is a single ramp inlet. Looking at a side view, that's an inlet in which we have one ramp. We form a shock wave. And all the compression occurs off that ramp. We can go with multiple ramp designs. With a multiple ramp, we add extra ramps to increase the compression. Um, multiple ramps tend to reduce the size of the inlet. So the inlet has fewer viscous losses. They also tend to increase the required turning to straighten out the flow inside the engine. And that can introduce some losses, some drag losses. In general, though, I think the trend is that the more ramps you put on the inlet, the more efficient the inlet will be. And the limit, the limit of that is a compression spike in which you have so many ramps that your inlet approximates an isentropic compression. Um, those are difficult to design, but I wouldn't be surprised if the hypersonic vehicles we see flying in, next, in the following generations incorporate some aspect of compression spikes. OK, I've been emphasizing the need of uniformity. Thank you. Why is it that we want uniformity? Uh, several reasons. One, we'd like to use multiple engine units spaced along the span of the vehicle. The goal then would be design one engine unit and, and use that same engine unit at several different locations. So you'd like each engine to be using, the, seeing the same incoming flow. Um, 
we'd like to reduce uh, the sensitivity to variations in flight conditions. If the flow isn't uniform, it turns out that we can get drastic changes in the flow properties into the engine with relatively small changes in the angle of attack or yaw or even Mach number. Um, also, it will give us more useful mass flow into the engines. If we have large-scale non-uniformities, if we have large boundary layers coming into the engines, then that's perhaps mass which is not useful in the combustion system. The boundary layers can be very hot, and they tend to have very low density, which means there just isn't very much oxygen there. There isn't much there to burn in. And that will compromise engine performance. Let me show you a picture of a generic ramp-type inlet. Um, simplest model of, these of, of this sort of inlet is just a, an oblique wedge. The wedge, of course, in supersonic flow will form a shock. Now, you note that in this particular ramp inlet, I've shown some sidewalls. Sidewall compression is usually a concept that is assumed to be associated with realistic scramjet inlets. That's done for several reasons. One, it reduces the overall required length of the inlet, therefore it reduces the, side, the length of the vehicle. Also, with sidewall compression, we can be less sensitive to flight conditions. Right? Consider the uh, shock structure on just the ramp. If we only have one ramp providing our compression, and if we change the effective angle attack of the vehicle, we change the ramp angle, we therefore change the shock angle. We can get large-scale changes in the thermodynamic conditions coming across that shock. Well, if we now divide our compression between this ramp and the sidewall ramps, then changes in vehicle angle of attack will affect this ramp, but they'll have relatively little effect on these ramps. So it tends to minimize sensitivity of the vehicle to flight conditions. Um, I've also indicated in this cartoon picture two struts. Those might be fuel struts. And there is, always, there is a, a continuing question of how you actually inject the fuel into a scramjet vehicle. It isn't clear that fuel struts are the way to do it because these fuel struts will obviously get very, very hot, especially at the high Mach numbers. Um, and it isn't clear how many of these fuel struts you'll act ultimately need in order to get sufficient mixing inside the engine. But bear in mind that those could be an important feature of a hypersonic engine system. Okay. One particular type of inlet that I'd like to talk about, and primarily because it's a personal favorite of mine, and I think it's also a personal favorite of Dr. Anderson and Dr. Bocotts, is something called a wave rider based inlet. Um, a wave rider is a generic hypersonic shape, hypersonic configuration which is designed by defining a shock flow field, such as a conical flow field, and then selecting a stream surface which intersects that shock that, that, uh, that shock that has been induced by that flow field. In other words, we define a flow surface which intersects a shock, and then if we imagine that that flow surface is a wall, such as a wing or the lower surface of a vehicle, and we now have a flow surface which has a shock attached to its leading edge. Now, what are the advantages? Well, if we use that wave rider, which is the portion of the shock indicated by dashed lines, if we use that wave rider for the full hypersonic vehicle, then we tend to find very high lift over drag ratios. This is primarily because the shock uh, contains the high pressure flow. It can't leak out from the leading edge. And indeed, that's shown in this plot, this is a plot of maximum lift over drag for hypersonic configurations. These are not inlets, these are not engines, these are just generic hypersonic uh, configurations versus Mach number. Um, the open circles represent a whole range of hypersonic vehicles. These are flight tests, wind tunnel tests, um, you name it. And this was com compiled by several individuals, um, taken from, as I said, lots of different data sets. Um, the dark, uh, dark symbols, the squares and the circles, are wave riders designed in a variety of schemes. Uh, some of these wave riders were designed by Dr. Bocott, who will be talking in, in this afternoon on, on uh, hypersonic applications. The key I want to bring out, though, is that all these designs give us ma the, the most L over D that we have ever seen for vehicles operating in the hypersonic realm. Now, there's a feature to wave riders that seems to be particularly desirable in the design of a hypersonic inlet. And that is, if you go back to the picture of the wave rider, remember that this shock is attached to the leading edge. And that means that there's no pressure leakage around that leading edge. Flow is contained. And indeed, the flow on that, un on if this is the undersurface of a vehicle, the flow will be conical flow because it's flow that was derived by assuming a conical flow field. In other words, streamlines go straight back on the vehicle. 
That's good. That's what we'd like in a hypersonic inlet. And if you use that concept, you can use that concept to design hypersonic inlets, and you can show um, that you can actually develop inlets based on the wave rider concept, which supply highly uniform flow properties to an engine. And we think that's very promising. And this, this view graph comes to us courtesy of one of my graduate students, Mary Kay O'Neill, who's been working with generating these sorts of convex, highly uniform inlets with a wave rider concept. Um, you can play games with the degree of uniformity that you want. For instance, if you're willing to relax the uniformity a little bit, then you get shapes which look much more reasonable for the front of a hypersonic vehicle. And one of the nice features about this is when we look at this convex shape, we look at the uniformity, we're very pleased. Right? These are contours that Ms. O'Neill has provided of pressure and mass flux coming into the inlet of the engine. Key thing I want to point out is that with those designs, we get less than a 9% variation of pressure across the inlet, which is what you'd want. Um, and you, we get less than a 5% variation of mass flux across the inlet. So ultimately, it is possible to design an inlet which gives you good flow properties, gives you uniform flow, gives you uniform pressure, uniform mass flux. Um, just another example of the wave rider concept. This is a solution that comes also from one of, one of our other graduate students, Naru Takashima, who's been doing full, compu full three-dimensional computational solutions on wave rider shapes. And this might be a, a hypersonic inlet. This could be a hypersonic inlet. And you see the flow, again, is very nicely uniform. Shock is attached to the leaning edge as we desire it. No, no spillage, no leakage on design. Um, what can we do with that? Well, if, you're, if you have that sort of inlet, and you can take it one step further and design an entire vehicle, which gives you relatively uni uniform flow conditions. And again, I think we see this, this is very promising in the realm of inlet, engine inlet interactions. OK. I want to focus now your attention towards some of the issues inherent in fundamental hypersonic flows, issues that we'll be dealing with when we talk about what goes on at the forebody of a hypersonic vehicle. And to whet your appetite for the next portion of our talk, I want to show you the following f pictures, if our overhead camera. Right. This picture shows you hypersonic flow past the slender cone. It's a three degree semi-vertex angle. And it's a picture that was taken in helium at Mach 41. So it's a relatively extreme Mach number. But there are some key features I want to point out in this picture. One, notice how closely the shock, which is indicated here, is pressed to the vehicle surface. Very, very small shock layer. The second feature I want to point out is something that was alluded to yesterday. Remember when Dr. Anderson was talking about hypersonic boundary layers, he told you that hypersonic boundary layers are thick. Well, you see that very dramatically inside in this example. The boundary layer in this picture is all the region between the cone and this bright region up here. So in fact, most of the flow underneath this shock is boundary layer flow. Remember that that flow is extremely hot and very low density. Now imagine if this were the front of a hypersonic vehicle and the engine were sitting right here. Well, think about what, what sort of flow conditions this engine would be seeing. Not particularly conducive to good engine design. And so when we design a hypersonic vehicle, we have to be willing to deal with this boundary layer, either incorporate it, swallow it into the engine, divert it in some way, or somehow minimize its impact on the vehicle design. And that's what we'll be talking about in the next segment of our, of our short course. Are there any questions? One quick question on wave riders. Is yes. There, is there a you have to design a separate, a different shape for every micro. Is that true? Or? That's right. The wave rider is an on is an on design configuration. Now, one of the arguments that's been used conventionally against wave riders as well, they obviously won't work off design. We've been showing that that's wrong. Wave riders obviously don't work as well off design as they do on design. But it turns out they work pretty well off design. Certainly, as you know, my argument is any vehicle is really a single point design vehicle, and any vehicle is not going to work as well off design as it did at the design point. Wave riders are no worse, as far as we can tell, than any other vehicle. We've got that from computational analysis, and we're getting some wind tunnel data that seems to corroborate that assumption. What are the ramifications in, with regards to safety for a commercial vehicle using hydrogen fuel? Ah, well, this is always one of my arguments. Whenever you say hydrogen, people say, oh, wait a minute, hydrogen is dangerous. There's the Hindenburg, there's the shuttle. My answer is that, in fact, hydrogen is very safe. If you look at those two accidents, the Hindenburg didn't explode. It was a rapid burn. In fact, most of the people survived that accident. The shuttle didn't explode either. The shuttle also did a rapid burn. Uh, the orbiter basically survived the blast. It was aerodynamic forces that broke it up. 
So my argument is that if you handle it safely, if you can store it safely, um, hydrogen should intrinsically be no more dangerous than any other aviation fuel. It might be a controversial statement, but one, one that I'll stand by. And I think that's probably all the time we have for this segment.